Good morning. Welcome here this morning to worship the Lord together. Um, just a few announcements. A baptism service will be held mid-August. Please speak to either the pastors or a board member if you'd like to be baptized. And is that date finalized? The 14th of August? Or? 14th. August 14th, that is being planned for. We're not sure where, just when. Okay. Our swimming pool. <laughs> <laughs> might be a good spot. It's heated, right? It's safer than a river. Heated? Naturally heated. <laughs> Our congregation has been asked to bake for Echo Lake Bible Camp. Apparently that has been fulfilled, I believe. Can I just add to that? Yep. I was just there last week, and some buns were... Minuscule? Not, not Joe sized? No, not Joe sized. And they need to be a normal size and kind of all the same size. And they did eat a lot. So <laughs> there was a few of them. And this milk cake. So make them Basically. ample. Joe size. <laughs> Joe size. And, and can you please have those here on the 14th of August as well? I believe some people here have graciously offered to take them down. Um, Camp and Massa North is looking for help as well. They're a non-denominational organization which provides camping opportunities for adults with intellectual disabilities. And you can see the poster in the foyer if you want more info. Echo Lake Bible Camp is looking for cooks for the July 25th to th through 30th week, and see Doreen if you are willing to help. Prayer and praise. Um, so many people missing throughout the summer holidays, so much traveling going on. Um, let's continue to pray for all those people, as well as the regulars, uh, Rod, Josiah, Andrew and Amanda, John and Tina, John Schultz, John and Leona, <laughs> We tend to, when, when, when there's a person in a family dynamic is suffering, we tend to overlook the other person sometimes. And so whenever I think of John Schultz suffering with cancer and it getting worse, we tend to forget his spouse. But let's remember them in our prayers. Um, just a short Bible reading, and then we will be singing some songs. Psalm 145, <clears throat> verses 1 through 10. I will extol you, my God, O King, and I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you, and I will praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his great greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise your works to another, and she shall declare your mighty acts. I will meditate on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works. Men shall speak of might, of the might of your awesome acts, and I will declare your greatness. They shall utter the memory of your great goodness and shall sing of your righteousness. The Lord is great, gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. The Lord is good to all and his tender mercies are over all his works. All your works shall praise you, O Lord, and your saints shall bless you. Let's start number 161, standing on the promises, number 161. <clears throat>
turn to number 173. <clears throat> there is power in the blood, number 173. <clears throat> Flip over to 324. Deeper and deeper. You may be seated if you want to sit and just sing along with this one. Deeper and deeper, number 324. <coughs> <coughs>
extend a warm welcome to everyone here today. I'm hoping you are as thrilled to be here as I am. I am glad you're here. It's a blessing when you're standing up front and you see eager anticipating faces down there. And I've done my due diligence. I've prayed that God would have something for you today, so I know he will. Andy, you had no idea what I was speaking on? Oh, how he loves. Oh, how he loves. And we're going to see that today. Pastor Kevin has been doing a series in Exodus of the Israelites fleeing Egypt. Now, these guys have been in slavery in Egypt for years and years. And finally, God says to Moses, it's time you go tell Pharaoh to let them go. It's time they can go. And Pharaoh, of course, says no. And he gets hit by a plague. And then he says, well, maybe. And it happens over again and over again. Ten times this happens. And finally, and it happens over the course of about a year, is what I read in commentaries. And finally, they get to go. As they're leaving, of course, the army's chasing them. So if you've ever had anybody chasing you, you know how it works, right? You're like this, you're like this, constantly looking back. You've all had the dream where the bear chases you right to the door. <laughs> yeah. And then just before he gets there, you get to open the door. But that's the feeling that these guys would have had as they were leaving Egypt to get to the Red Sea. Now, when they get to the Red Sea, they camp on the shore. God provides, makes a path for them, parts the sea. Through the sea they go on dry land. Here comes their enemies behind them. So you're still going to be looking back and you're going to be, uh-oh. Now how far are we going to go? And then God causes the sea to collapse on the enemy. God takes care of the enemy for them. Can you imagine if you will, the feeling that these people would have had, these Israelites that Moses is leading, the feeling they would have had seeing their enemy finally crushed, knowing that they had freedom. No wonder they picked a song and, and wrote a song. It's called the Song of the Sea. Kevin spoke about that last weekend. Some call it the Song of Moses. But these guys were so elated to be saved that they were singing songs, right? So today my question for you is, what motivates you spiritually? Is it intellect? Just knowing that God loves you and uh, that he sent a son is it just intellect? Is it feelings? <coughs> is it emotion? These people were singing this song based on emotion. And spoiler alert, as Kevin goes forward in the series, they tend to slip again, right? Moses has to continuously pray to God to get his people back on track. And God spares them and does it again. But they kept slipping because at that point, their faith was still just based on emotion. In the Bible, faith is an action word. It's a verb. <gasps> Even though feelings and emotions are good, they are part of our worship service, part of what makes us sing to the Lord, faith cannot and must not be based on feelings. Not feelings alone, that's for sure. Because it'll be give you an anal analogy here. It'll be like a person having a heart attack. You go to, you get an ECG when you're having a heart attack when you go to a hospital and the monitor is going boop, 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 boop. it's going all over the map, right? And then flat, finally it flatlines. That's what feelings and emotions will do to your faith if that's all it's based on. It needs to be based on more than just feelings and emotions. And I'm hoping that today you can see that. I want to share 
with you a story before we even start. And this is a story, it's called For My Sister. There's a true story of a little boy whose sister needed a blood transfusion. The doctor explained that she had the same disease that the boy had recovered from two years earlier. Her only chance of recovery was a transfusion from someone who had previously conquered this disease. Since the two children had the same rare blood type, the boy was the ideal donor. Would you give your blood to Mary? The doctor asked. Johnny hesitated. His lower lip started to tremble. Then he smiled and he said, sure, for my sister. Soon the day came when the two children were wheeled into the hospital room. Mary, pale and thin, Johnny, robust and healthy. Neither spoke, but when their eyes met, Johnny grinned. As the nurse inserted the needle into his arm, Johnny's smile started to fade. He watched the blood flow through the tube. With the or ordeal almost over, Johnny's voice, slightly shaky, broke the silence. He said, Doctor, when do I die? Only then did the doctor realize why Johnny had hesitated, why his lip had trembled when he agreed to donate his blood. He thought giving his blood to his sister would mean giving up his life. And in that brief moment, he had made a huge decision. For our reading today, it's a passage you all know. John 3, 16. One verse. John 3, 16 says this. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever should believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. everlasting life. How do people react when they hear this verse? Do they say, wow, that's love? Or do they say, oh, that's, that's pretty cool. What's the reaction? You know, what do we do about it? What do we do about this verse? There's another story that says, I heard about this nun she was a home health aide, a worker. She travels from house to house taking care of people. One day, she ran out of gas. There was a station a couple of blocks away. She didn't have a gas can handy, so she got the bedpan from the back of her car. She walks over to the gas station, fills it up with gas, and carries it back to the car. As she pours the liquid from the bedpan into the gas tank, a state trooper rolls up. He says, Lady, if that car starts, I'm going to be in church every Sunday for the rest of my life. The car started. What's, what's our reaction when we hear John 3.16? Do we need even more? People are looking for huge miracles in order for them to get them to church, right? You've all read the, seen the cartoon where it says, Lord, give me a sign and person standing under a sign and it falls and hits him in the head. And usually that doesn't even send him to church, right? But I believe this is one of the greatest love sentences in the whole Bible. For a pack of smarties, who knows what the love chapter is in the Bible? Yes. Come and get it. First Corinthians 13 is the love chapter, but I believe this is the love verse. To me, there is no verse that is bigger than this when it speaks about what God has done for us and what we should be embracing. Here's a few quotes about this verse. John Graham Lott says this, John 3.16 is the North Pole of the Bible. If you align your life up with this, you will find your way home. And Martin Luther said this, John 3.16 is the gospel in a nutshell, a miniature gospel, if you will. If we lost all of the Bible and kept John 3.16, we would have enough gospel 
to be converted and have eternal life. So if you know nothing of the Bible, if you know everything of the Bible, return here. This is the hope diamond of the scripture. So before we go any further and take this verse apart, let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word, your wonderful word that leads, guides, changes lives. We thank you for your love for us and what you have done to gain us back to you. All we must now do is believe. Lord, as we look into this verse this morning, help us to do our part. Help us to see your love, your truth, and then help us to embrace it. And as we just spend time together here with others, help us to be an encouragement. And, and Lord, may your spirit move freely. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I've uh, titled my message today, Back to the Basics. Now, before we take this verse apart here, <clears throat> before we get into John 3.16, let me set the stage a little bit. It all begins with a silent figure moving stealthily through the darkened streets of Jerusalem. Nicodemus was one of the Pharisees. He's one of the religious elite who were around at that time. And they rejected Jesus. So when he decided to seek Christ out and to learn from him, he had to do it in secret. He couldn't do it with all his peers watching. So he's kind of sneaking around here in the dimly lit streets. And Nicodemus finds his way to the house where Jesus and his followers are staying. And then in John 3, 2, he says this, Rabbi, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. You're miraculous signs are evidence that God is in you. And then without hesitation, Jesus says this, I tell you the truth. Unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. John 3.3. 3. Now I'm not sure what Jesus' mindset would be that right then, but it's, or Nicodemus' mindset, but it's clear what Jesus was telling him. It's clear that Christ was going to give him an exposition on how to reach salvation. And then that's where we lead up to John 3.16. That's the climax of what Jesus is telling Nicodemus. So in this one verse, we see the whole gospel of Jesus Christ and how it relates to us. I want to look at some of the beautiful sections in this verse. And we're going to start with two single words. He loves. Oh, how he loved. Oh, how he loved. It says, for God so loved the world. Now, if those words are true, it changes everything, doesn't it? Imagine what this world would be like without God's love. No hope. No future. Nothing to live for. No greater purpose for our existence than this. Every death would be final. Every grave would be a place of despair. But God does love the world. We see it in the sunrise. We see it in the grass. We see it in the lakes and in the mountains. Every fountain of water, the stars, they declare his handiwork, it says. Children's faces. God so loved the world. I want you to notice something here. It's not the quantity. It's not the world, the vastness of the world, but the quality. So, God so loved the world. That little word means a lot. Here in John 3.16, we have God's love for us for the giving of, by the giving of his son. And it says, God so loved the world. The word so emphasizes intensity. It means, I love you so much that I can feel it, right? I don't just love you a little bit. I don't, I love you so much. I did something about it. And that's the key. 
he did something about it. Now, after I come home, let's say I've been staying in camp for a week of work and I see Susan in the kitchen, I run up to give her a hug and I say, I love you so much, I missed you so much. That so has a big meaning. It packs power. There's a difference between saying, I love you and I love you so much, or I missed you, or I missed you so much. That little word has a lot of power. And that's what it's doing here, right? Now, um, kids, some of you have watched, how many of you have watched VeggieTales? <laughs> Who's watched VeggieTales? Are you guys? It's okay if you have, and it doesn't have to be little kids. I watched VeggieTales, come on guys. <laughs> VeggieTales were awesome. You watched VeggieTales, didn't you? Yes, we watched VeggieTales in our house. Okay, now in case you don't know about VeggieTales, this is a, a bit of a cartoon. It's animated vegetables that bring Bible stories to kids, right? And it brings Sunday morning values, Saturday morning fun. You watch it with your kids, it's good. Well, at the end of every episode, Bob says something. Who knows what Bob was? What was Bob? What kind of vegetable? Natalie? A tomato. A tomato. Come and get it. <laughs> Bob was a tomato. Now, for another hundred dollars, who knows what Bob said? That's a that's a harder one. Kathy, you know. What did Bob say? Here's what he said. Remember, kids, God made you special. And he loves you very much. That's what Bob would say at the end of every VeggieTales. Isn't that the message of John 3.16? Isn't that the message that the world needs to hear? God has made you special. He made you in his own image. Now, if that's not special enough for you, I don't think anything will cut it then you're probably going to have to go see a plastic surgeon. You know. But he loves you very much. He made you special. He made you in his own image. Right? So we, we really should be pretty satisfied with how God has made us. Like we shouldn't really have complaints about that, I hope. The pages of scripture are filled with a series of his love passages of his love as the father has loved me so he I have loved you is what Jesus says we are more than conquerors in him who loved us the life which I now live I live by faith in the son of God who loved me you see all these passages of love and yet we go through something like last two years and we get all discouraged and downhearted we have much more. The lemons this world throws at us don't have to knock us down. We have so much more, right? Romans 8, 38 to 39 says this. I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries for tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing at all, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that's revealed in Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, you may say, Pastor, you have no idea what I've been through. No, I don't. But I want to give you a little illustration here today. I need two volunteers. Brooklyn, you didn't get Smarties yet, right? Okay. Do you want to be one of my volunteers? Okay. Another one? Logan. All right. Sorry, I just need two. Okay, come on up. I'm going to illustrate to you that no nothing you've been through can separate you from the value of who you are. Hey Brooklyn, you're gonna hold this $20 bill. Just hold it, like stretch it out and just hold it still, okay? 
Logan, you get that $20 bill. I want you to crunch it, crinkle it, roll it, do whatever you want. Just crinkle it up. Okay. Now I want you to show it to the people. Okay. How much is the $20 bill worth that Brooklyn's holding? $20. How much is the dollar bill hold that uh, Logan's holding? How much is that worth? $20. $20. No matter how life has crinkled you, <coughs> crumpled you, stepped on you, you are still worth exactly the same amount to God. The wrinkles, the crinkles, they don't change your worth to God. Okay, you guys can go. Thanks. You keep it. <laughs> yes. What changes your worth to God? Nothing. He made you in his image. He loves you. The crinkles don't change you. And because he loves, he gives. Here's what God does. He said, God so loved the world that he gifted. The word is used gifted. Gave, gifted. He gave you a gift. So what do you do with gifts? God's love for us was so big that he gave us a gift. Do we reject gifts? Generally, we enjoy gifts. Usually, that's kind of what we like about things. A free gift? Yeah, I'm all about that, right? He gave his only son. He doesn't just talk about how much he loves us. He does something about it. He proves it. He gives us his only son. That same expression is used in the second line of the Apostles' Creed. It says, I believe in God, the Father, a mighty maker of heaven and earth, and Jesus Christ, the only begotten son. The word begotten means one of a kind, one and only. That's what that means. It's not, it's not like God had a bunch and he said, well, here you can have one of them. His one and only son, he gifted for you and I. That's how much he loves us. Imagine how hard that would be if you have kids. You can imagine. Let's say your kid says, well, mom, dad, I decided I'm going to join the army and I'm going to go fight over in Iraq or <laughs> Afghanistan. You have one kid. Chance of them coming back aren't very good. But they're going to sacrifice for your country, for you. <coughs> Romans 5, 8 says, God demonstrated his love for us that in while we were yet sinners, we were still separate from him. We didn't deserve love. He demonstrated his love for us that he sent his son to die on the cross for us. That's how much he loves. Now this sounds strange to some people. Some people don't get this concept. They're like, why would he do that? I can respect the teachings of Jesus. I can respect some of those. That's admirable. But no matter how you turn it, I don't see the significance of his death. One man even said, that's the craziest thing I've heard. I don't need God to give anyone for me. I've led a good life. I held a good job. People respect me. My wife loves me. I don't need God to give me a son. Well, maybe you agree with that. But... Are we really as good as we think we are? Let's see how well you score against God's basic laws. His Ten Commandments. You shall not steal. I'll just give you a few. You shall not steal. Most of us would have to admit we've broken that one. Maybe you take a pen out of a hotel room. I mean, people don't take the mattress home. But the shampoo and pen, well, they're usually fair game, right? Well, are they really ours? Or a grape at a store? You must not lie. Well, if you tell me you never have, you just did. You shall not take the name of your Lord God in vain. Well, I don't know if you've ever hit your thumb with a hammer, but you've got pretty good self-control if you didn't say anything more than ouch. Right? We try not to, but things happen. Frustration sets in. How about you shall not commit murder? Oh yeah, we, none of us have done that, right? How about the last time somebody cut you off on the highway and you said, oh, I hate that person. Guess what? Jesus said you just murdered him. You're like, whoa. 
As logging truck drivers, Chris and I know all about this, traveling from Fort St. James down to Andrews. <coughs> there are so many crazies on that road. How about you shall not covet? Most of us desire something the neighbor has. Might not be his wife or his donkey, I don't. I would never want a donkey on my property, but that's what the Bible talks about. But it means anything. How about his BMW? You shall not covet. There, that's only five of them. And it says if you've broken one, you've broken all. We could keep going, but I don't think it gets any better. Most sincere people, if you're honest, are going to admit that we're not really as good as we think we are. We all have regrets. We all have mistakes. The Bible calls it sin. And we do it all the time. The Bible tells us that in, in Romans 3.23 it says for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God our sin separates us from God it puts a great big chasm <coughs> we're on this ledge God is on this ledge it puts a great big chasm that we cannot ever cross on our own sin separates and then it was up to him to find a way to reconcile us to him and that's where Jesus came in. He determined to build that bridge so that we could get back to God. And it was a bridge of a cross. That cross is the bridge back to Jesus. John 14, 6 says this. Jesus says to him, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. In verse 14, Jesus alludes to an event in the Old Testament. It's a story told in Numbers 21, 4 to 9. It was a story of sin. The children of Israel, God's special people, they rebelled against God again. Moses interceded for the people again. And God provided the remedy. He told Moses to make a brass serpent to lift it up on a pole for everyone to see. Anyone who had been bitten by the serpents, which was the punishment for how they had rebelled, anyone who had been bitten by the serpents who looked to this pole with that serpent wrapped around it were healed. To this day, the medical system, the hospitals, the ambulances, they have that logo on on the, on the medical clinic, on the hospital, on the Amazon, they all have that same logo. Looking to that for healing. Although God's remedy was sufficient for all of Israel, it is only for, sufficient for those who look upon the serpent, who look upon the solution. And God loves. Jesus sacrificed. It was sufficient for the whole world. But it's only effective if we have looked to Christ. If we haven't looked to it, if we haven't looked to Christ and trusted him, that whole love gift thing can't apply. We must apply it to our life. And when that happens, when we believe, Jesus said that God gave his own and only son, that whoever believes, what? He shall not perish. This concept <laughs> runs contrary to our instincts, right? It's so simple. We expect a complicated cure, a more sophisticated salvation. But what about the Bible verse that said, God helps those who help themselves? It's not in the Bible. That's not in the Bible. You've all heard that, but that's not in the Bible. No other religion <laughs> provides what Jesus promises. Judaism says salvation is judgment day. Decision based on morality. Buddhism grades your life according to four noble truths and an eightfold path. Muslim earn their way to Allah by performing duties of the five pillars of faith. Not Christianity. Jesus calls us to do one thing. Believe. Listen to some of the verses here and what the Bible says. John 1.12 Yet to all who received him 
to those who believed in his name, he gave them the right to become children of God. And John 3, 36, he who believes in the Son has everlasting life. He who does not believe in the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on them. John 6, 47, most assuredly, I say to you, and when he says most assuredly, he said, this is a promise. He who believes in me has eternal life. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow living, wa living water, rivers of living water. John 7, 38. Think of the Philippian jailer. They bring him out, they brought him out, and he says to, to Paul and the others, he says this, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? What do I need to do to be saved? I see you guys are doing big things. What must I do? And they say this, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. There it is. Boom. It wasn't something fancy. It wasn't something big. It was plain and simple and blunt. And in Ephesians 2, 8 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. It is not of anything of yourselves. It is a gift of God. So maybe you've been thinking about baptism. You say, what about baptism? What about repentance? How about a changed life? Are you saying those things aren't necessary? No, I'm not saying that. Those things are essential. But baptism, repentance, a changed life, things like that are not qualifications to make you savable. They're not qualifications to faith. They are expressions of it. Those are things we do when we have been saved. What do we need to do to be saved? Here's your question. What do we need to do to be saved? Believe. Believe. Yeah. That's it. That's what the Bible says. Why do we want to change it? Why do we think we need to make it all complicated? Right? So I want to encourage you. If you've been thinking about baptism and stuff, like we were talking about doing on August 14th, you have been saved, by all means, do it. Baptism doesn't save, though. You need to know that. That's not what it does. <coughs> what Jesus wants to see is that it's not because of what I've done, but because of who he is. All he asks for is us to put our trust in him long time ago there lived an elderly man whose one and only son preceded him in death the man was very wealthy but because they could find no living heirs his estate was auctioned off when he died people came from miles around to bid on his wonderful antiques and riches proudly displayed in the courtyard of his mansion the first item up for bid was a very amateur portrait of the rich man's son no one bit. It didn't look that great. The attendants grew restless, anxious to bid on those treasures, but the auctioneer wouldn't proceed to any other items until the painting had sold. Finally, a sweet young lady with a southern accent bid on the painting. She had worked at this manor as a maid for a little while. She knew how much that boy meant to that father. As soon as she put in a bid, the auctioneer threw down his gavel he announced that the auction was over, to everyone's astonishment. He walked over to the woman, he gave her the painting, and he told her everything that she could see around her was now hers. The elderly man had left specific instructions in his will that whoever buys the son gets it all. The Bible says in John, 1 John 5.12, whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the Son does not have life. Max Lucado said, God rewards those who seek Him. Those who, not those who seek doctrine or religion or a system or creeds. Many settle for these lesser passions, but the reward goes to those who settle for nothing less than Jesus Himself.
And, the reward, and that reward is when we believe, what happens? We live. We live. Whoever believes in him, God says, shall not perish, but have eternal life. Now, although people sometimes spend time imagining eternity, I've done that. It's like, I wonder what that would be like. I wonder what it's going to be like. Some people say it's like floating in the clouds or strumming a harp. Well, I can't strum a harp here, so I kind of doubt if I'll strum a harp up there. But that's certainly not the biblical picture of heaven. The Bible describes heaven as a place that will have rivers. It's going to have trees. It's going to have cities. It's going to have buildings, gates, streets, mountains, houses. That's all in Revelation. That's heaven. So although the glory is beyond description, its essential components will be quite the same as what we have around us now. We will have a new heaven and a new earth. This one will pass away. But I believe God will rebuild it similar, but just way better. Now, the full, full glory is just beyond description. But I think paradise is going to be good. And God intended that. So, that's not all that heaven's about. It's not all just about beauty. One of the greatest blessings <clears throat> of heaven is what won't be there. No death. No diseases. No divorce. No trials, tribulation, turmoil. Without the presence of evil, the new heaven and the new earth will be like nothing we have ever experienced. It's going to be good. No suffering. No funeral homes. No abortion clinics. Psych psychiatric wards. No rape. Missing children. Drug habilitation centers. No muggings. Killings. No worry. No depression. No economic downturns. No COVID. I can say that. No put downs. No envy. Those are so many, there are so many things what heaven will not have, which are bad things here, but they're good, they'll be good that they're not there, right? And yet, <clears throat> there's still more, right? What about your loved ones? The loved ones who have passed on before us. Imagine meeting your spouses, grandparents, parents, siblings, maybe children, holding the hands of loved ones that you once laid to rest. We say until we meet again. Do we believe it? Have we done something about it? Have we accepted that gift? What joy will there be on that day? And we're going to have a relationship face-to-face -face relationship with the one who gave his blood who saved me from what I am, a wretch. What a day that will be, right? We'll see why he did what he did. So in conclusion, I want to leave you with this story here. <clears throat> Jason Tuskus. <clears throat> He was a 17-year-old high school student. He was an honor student. He was close to his mother, his wheelchair-bound father, and especially close to his younger brother. Jason was an expert swimmer, and he loved to scuba dive. He left home on Tuesday morning to explore a spring, an underwater cave near his home in West Central Florida. His plan was to be home in time to celebrate his mother's birthday by going to dinner with the family that night. Jason became lost in the cave. And then in his panic, he sat, swam through a very tight spot and got wedged into a narrow passageway. When he realized he was trapped, he shed his yellow metal air tank, took out his diver's knife, and with the tank as a tablet and the knife as a pen, he wrote one last message to his family. He wrote, I love you so much, Mom.
Dad and Chris, I will miss you. Then he ran out of air and perished. A dying message, something communicated in the last few seconds of life, is something we can't ignore. God's final mm -hmm. words to us, etched on a Roman cross, written in red, they say, I love you this much. What will you do about it? What will we do about it? It really is that simple. He loves. He gives. We believe. We live. God loved this world more than we will ever know. He gave his one and only son so that we could live forever with him. Choose life. Receive Jesus. And if you aren't sure if you've done that, you probably haven't. So do it today. Do it when he calls on you. 2 Thessalonians 3.5 says this. Now may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patience of Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this verse. It's so profound and yet so simple. Help us to embrace it. Help us to trust in it. And help us never to take it for granted. We know you paid a huge sacrifice for us to be reconciled back to you. That chasm was bridged by a cross. Until we come to that cross, we do not get to live with you. But if we have come to that cross and we embrace it, the story of it, the story behind it, we trust in Jesus Christ and him alone, Father, we can be confident in saying that we are children of God. You have promised us you will adopt us if we trust in this, if we simply believe. And Father, as we just reveal this to others around us, we are just beggars telling another beggar where we found the bread. Help us to do it in love. Help us to share the gospel wherever we go. We think of so many who are struggling, so many who have around us just looked at the world and uh, felt defeated. We don't have to be defeated, Father. This world is temporary. And as we, as we learn to trust in you more, we learn to be encouraged more. And help us to be joyful Christians. So as we go from here, we ask that you would bless us. But even more than that, make us a blessing somewhere. We ask in your precious name. Amen. Do does a message like that make us homesick? Yeah. Yeah. It's coming a day. We just changed the last, I just changed our last hymn. Let's turn our hymnals to number 252. What a day that will be, number 252. <coughs>
this was in Jude. Now to him who is able to do, uh, sorry, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, and to present you faultless before the presence of His glory with exceeding joy, to God our Savior, who alone is wise, the glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. <laughs>